I'm, I'm very grateful to the, to the faculty of this university and to the, and to the dean and to the uh, rector and to all of you who have come uh, this, uh, this morning. Um, I, I have not chosen an easy subject for this, uh, for this lecture. You, you, you have not honored me for talking about easy subjects and global justice, which is uh, what I want to talk about today, global and local justice, these are difficult, uh, difficult questions. A global justice would seem to require a global theory, a single philosophically grounded account of what justice is that explains why it ought to be realized in exactly this way everywhere right now. It requires a comprehensive story about the just society, about equality and liberty, about human need and moral luck, and much else. A story that need only be repeated again and again, for it applies in identical fashion in every country, even to every person in the world. But there are several well-known difficulties with this project. First, there's no one to tell the story to who can act authoritatively in its name. There's no global agent of justice whose legitimacy is widely recognized, who might take up the story in its one true version and pursue the project it describes. Second, we can't be sure that the story will be understood in the same way by all the people who hear it. The story doesn't connect with a single common life whose interests and ideals might make it first comprehensible and then appealing. There isn't a common life of that sort, or better, there are many common lives of different sorts. The diversity of cultures and the plurality of states make it unlikely that a single account of justice could ever be persuasive across the globe or enforceable in everyday practice. A global despot or a philosophical vanguard might manage the enforcement, but it's hard to see how their rule, even if it served the cause of justice, could itself be just. And yet, and yet the vast inequalities of wealth and power in the world today and the accompanying poverty, malnutrition, and illness cry out for a globally applicable critique. And so does the extreme vulnerability of so many people to natural disaster and political violence. And this necessary critique cannot endorse the idea that cultural difference makes a difference. It must insist on the simple wrongness of the human suffering that we currently live with and mostly accept. If we force ourselves to look, the picture is grim. Extraordinary wealth and terrible poverty the powerful few, and the powerless many, tyrants and warlords and their desperate victims. These polarities are, are frightening, and to my mind, they are obscene. But it is the people at their farther end whose living conditions and daily dying demand from us a single coherent moral and political response. We don't actually need to agree on the wrongness of inequality or on the moral significance of good luck or bad luck or on any full-scale theory of distributive justice in order to defend a global campaign against poverty, hunger, and disease, against mass murder and ethnic cleansing. No doubt each of these human disasters is partly even significantly the product of local causes and local agents but all of them are also the product of an international economy increasingly marked by the flow of money, labor, and goods across political boundaries and of an international politics increasingly marked by the use of force and the transfer of military resources across those same boundaries. Global impact takes precedence over local difference. So how should we address the terrible injuries endured by the people at the wrong end of the global polarities? How should we think about the urgent needs of the desperately poor and the desperately weak? Let's, let's agree 
that we can't agree on a theory of global justice and that there isn't right now a globally effective agent who could put any such theory into practice and right now is the absolutely necessary temporal rule. What we require instead is minimalist in character, the recognition of people like ourselves, sympathy with their suffering, and a few widely shared moral principles. If these three things amount to a theory, it is, so to speak, a little theory, one that is incomplete in much the same way that global society is incomplete. It can only do a few things, and it can do them only in a rough way. This minimalist account of justice right now has two aspects, which I will call humanitarian and political, and examine in that order. What work will remain to be done once justice right now is realized, if it is ever realized? What kind of justice lies beyond our current urgencies? That requires a maximalist theory adapted to the realities of culture and political difference, and I'll try to say something briefly about that also. When we see human beings suffer, we feel a natural empathy with them, and we want to help. The American philosopher John Rawls claims that there is a natural duty to help people in trouble, a duty of mutual aid. He is right, I think, and this duty must have its root in fellow feeling, in the pre-philosophical recognition of the others as people like us. It's this natural empathy that explains the outpouring of aid after a devastating flood or earthquake. The response comes from thousands of ordinary men and women acting through voluntary associations and from political communities acting in the name of their citizens. But it starts from the feelings of individuals. How can these feelings generate a duty? It must be because one of the things we feel is that we ought to feel this way. We ought to want to help. We think of floods and earthquakes as natural disasters, but we know that their effects are often aggravated by malevolent or negligent human agents. Similarly, many of the disasters of social life were once imagined as acts of nature, but these days we are rightly inclined to look for direct or indirect human agency. In all these cases, whether the resultant suffering is naturally caused or man-made, it is right to respond in a humanitarian way, acting out of fellow feeling. But whenever human agency is involved, we are also required to follow the causal chain and try to identify the agents. We have to examine the history of malevolence or negligence and consider the responsibilities of all the men and women in the chain, including ourselves. And once we know the names of the agents, natural duty may well be transformed into political obligation. But let's begin with the natural duty to relieve human suffering. We don't do this very effectively. Since there's so much suffering, it has so many different causes, and there isn't a single organized relief effort. Still, in particular cases, we ought to help as best we can and these cases extend beyond singular events like floods and earthquakes, epidemics, and massacres. They include general conditions like deep poverty, homelessness, endemic disease, and widespread ongoing persecution. We should probably focus mostly on poverty because it is the poor who suffer the most from every other kind of disaster. Americans saw this very clearly when Hurricane Katrina destroyed much of the city of New Orleans. It was the poorest residents who lived on the lowest ground, protected by the least looked after levees, whose homes suffered the greatest damage. And this is the common story. Disease kills first the weak and malnourished. Earthquake and fire are most deadly for those who live in jerry-built houses and tenements. Even man-made man -made disasters, like ethnic cleansing, where the violence cuts across class lines, will impact most cruelly on people without the resources 
that make escape possible. We can take poverty as the primary condition of human suffering, the first humanitarian crisis, the first object of our natural duty to help. Hence the effectiveness of Professor Thomas Pogge's argument that it would take only a small percentage of the gross national product of the wealthiest countries to aid to end global poverty. If this is true, there is a strong humanitarian argument for deploying those resources, whatever further or different deployments might be morally required. Sometimes, in the case of man-made disasters like massacre or ethnic cleansing, the necessary response requires the use of force. We call this humanitarian intervention, and like other forms of humanitarianism, it is a universal duty. The obligation to stop a massacre falls on anyone, that is, on any state or coalition of states capable of acting effectively. Individuals are not capable in such cases. And NGOs sometimes provide relief for the wounded, as they did in Bosnia in the 1990s, in ways that actually facilitate the ongoing killing. State action of a forceful kind is required here. The goal is to stop the massacre and then to install a non-murderous regime. Once again, the leaders of a military intervention don't require a theory of the best regime to guide their efforts. They, too, should be minimalists. Humanitarian responses should be the same whether the crisis is a natural disaster or the product of human action or inaction. Our natural duty is to relieve or end the suffering, and that is everyone's natural duty. If we examine the suffering caused by human beings, however, we will be led to argue for more particular obligations. Much of the world's poverty and many of the attendant disasters of poverty are caused, for example, by predatory rulers, corrupt oligarchs, and brutal warlords. These are the agents of political plunder, economic disruption, civil war, and the mass flight of refugees. They are not, however, the sole agents. For all of them, or most of them, are assisted or supported by more distant and less visible political and economic actors. Who are these actors? States seeking reliable allies and trading partners, offering to sell weapons and train police, Corporations looking for cheap labor or hoping to avoid environmental and safety regulation. Entrepreneurs bribing public officials and living outside local law. Banks eager to receive the plundered money. All these are agents of human disaster. And since some of these latter agents are acting on our behalf, their responsibility extends to us too. The relevant moral principle is as obvious and as often ignored as the principle of mutual aid. You must help undo injuries to other people that you have helped to cause. There are so many examples of this sort of complicity in human disaster that it will seem arbitrary to choose just one. But one will serve to illustrate my argument. In his book, The Bottom Billion, Paul Collier, an economist at Oxford, describes some of the ways Western governments and corporations help to sustain the deep poverty of the worst off people in the world. Consider, for example, the role of Western banks when poor countries experience revenue booms from oil or other mineral resources. Much of the money is siphoned off by local elites, often with the help of the extracting companies, and sent to banks in the West. What do the banks do then? I'm quoting Collier. Basically, he writes, they keep quiet about it. Is this a necessary consequence of banking secrecy laws? No, it is not. If the money is suspected of having terrorist associations, we, are, we now require the banks to blow the whistle on it. But if it is stolen from the ordinary citizens of the bottom billion, well, that is just 
too bad. That's the end of the quote from Carl. Your vast amounts of money have in fact been stolen, enough if it were well spent to make at least a dent in the deep poverty of the poorest countries. Now, I don't suppose that we have a natural duty to reform the banking system, but this is probably obligatory work for people who live in the countries that the banks serve and who benefit from the service. Of course, the obligations of bank officials and state regulators are more substantial and easier to specify, while those of ordinary citizens like you and me are weaker and much more diffuse. Still, they have some claim on us, and there are likely to be many obligations of this sort to oppose governmental assistance to predatory and corrupt regimes when it's our government, to support political and economic reconstruction in countries devastated by civil wars that we instigated or in which we intervened, to change trade policies that discriminate against poor countries, to require powerful transnational corporations based in our countries to pay minimum wages, protect the environment, observe safety laws, and recognize independent unions when they operate in other countries. But it might be argued we're not, in fact, going to do those things. We're not going to meet these obligations in sufficient numbers to succeed. Reparative justice as a political project is no less utopian than comprehensive justice. For even if the resource transfers to which we are immediately obligated are smaller than those required by a comprehensive theory of justice, they are still too large ever to command wide support among the self-interested citizens of the richest countries. That may be so but I suspect that the transfers are actually much smaller than a comprehensive theory would require, and what is equally important, they follow from principles of mutual aid and political responsibility that are widely accepted even when the required transfers are resisted. So there are political battles that can be fought here and that can be won or partly won, and the cause of justice right now can be incrementally advanced. Well then, can't comprehensive justice also be incrementally advanced by doing exactly the same things? The defeat of predatory rulers, the reconstruction of devastated countries, the reform of the banks, fair trade, and the regulation of transnational corporations, wouldn't all this also be required by any theory of comprehensive justice? But if all this is achieved by many states and, and non-governmental organizations working independently, working here and there, working more or less successfully, then it may not, in fact, advance a comprehensive scheme. And the very success of justice right now may make global comprehensiveness more difficult. That last point requires further brief explanation. One of the goals of justice right now in both its humanitarian and political aspects is to provide people around the globe with sufficient resources so that they can act on their own behalf. Immediate relief after a devastating flood, for example, should make it possible for people not only to resume a more or less normal life, but also to work with water engineers and state officials to prevent future floods. When we force banks to give up the plundered money of tyrants and warlords, we are hoping for the emergence of states that can invest the money in education and development. When we argue for fair trade, we are aiming at the creation of local economies capable of providing jobs and security. When we support political reconstruction after civil wars and massacres, we are trying to create regimes ready and able to protect the lives of all their citizens. The natural duty and the political obligation to aid disaster victims have this necessary corollary that we should not deal with disaster in, in ways that make it likely that we will have to deal with disasters again and again. We help people so as to make it possible for them to help themselves. 
and the crucial agent of self-help in the world as we know it is a state of their own, I mean a decent state, in their control, acting on their behalf, defending their rights and interests. It might be a good thing if there were international agencies that scrutinized, reported on, and regulated the activities of states, but no such agencies exist today. Justice right now works and only works in and through the sovereign states or semi-sovereign states of the global order. But the success of these states in maintaining peace and security, preventing flood and famine, providing education and welfare, planning economic development and policing foreign investors, while it would make the world more just, would not necessarily advance the cause of global justice if this is conceived in terms of a single comprehensive theory. For the local focus, the work of many different states would not produce anything like convergence on a single uniform system of distributive justice. How then should we think about justice over the long run? Relief and repair will create a world considerably more egalitarian than the world as it is today. Beyond that, I don't think that we need to insist on economic equality. If men and women everywhere were protected from the common disasters of nature and social life, if the predatory version of politics and business were under control, it seems to me that we could let cultural difference and political struggle and economic competition work their ways and produce whatever they produce. I don't mean that whatever they produce will be all right or good enough or even good at all. We will still require strenuous social criticism and even more important, repeatedly renewed political struggle. But these will now be local in character and reiterative across the globe. In a famous line, the Bible tells us, justice, justice shalt thou pursue. But the relative thou, once we have achieved economic sufficiency and political decency, is not humanity as a whole, but rather the plurality of human communities. Let there be many pursuits. Let a hundred flowers bloom. It is entirely appropriate that communities, cultures, and religions should have different ideas about the relative value of different social goods and also about the distributive criteria appropriate to each. Of course, there will be different priorities and different understandings even within the same community, the same culture or religion. Difference and disagreement are universal features of human life but there are also common fields of reference, common histories and literatures, common commitments to a shared future which give a particular shape to our disagreements. And these commonalities tend to be produced and reproduced within political communities, which also provide the space where distributive debates and disputes can be carried on. When the commonalities extend across political boundaries, as they apparently do in the case of the European Union, then the pursuit of justice should be extended in the same way. If, there, if they were ever to extend across the globe, we would need only a single pursuit of a uniform and comprehensive justice. But, the re, but regional extension is rare in the world today, and global extension is non-existent we see faint signs of its emergence with regard to some social goods, as in the universal lip service paid these days to the democratic distribution of political power. But lip service is far short of commitment and global understandings of many other social goods are remarkable in their divergence. Mutual aid in time of crisis and political responsibility for injuries across borders. These are the two necessary aspects of global justice, which is and ought to be a response to urgent need to the suffering of the worst off, 
the poor, and the powerless. Its time constraint is right now. But the long-term distribution of social goods among people who have been freed from the urgencies of poverty and powerlessness, that should be their own work. That is local justice. And for that, there is no time constraint. The work goes on and on. At any given moment, we are simply engaged. What I am proposing here is that we think about local distributive justice in much the same way as we think about self-determination and the politics of liberation. Each collective self must determine itself by itself. The process is reiterative. Some selves may imitate earlier determinations, some may not. But they must do whatever they do by themselves. Similarly, as the maxim of the old left has it, the liberation of the working class must be the work of the working class itself. Maybe the workers will follow in the footsteps of the bourgeoisie, maybe not. And again, national liberation must be the work of each oppressed or subordinate nation. Even when the project receives support from around the world, no one wants those external supporters to determine what liberation means for this nation. Only its own people can rightly do that. And similarly, again, the distribution of social goods must be decided by the men and women who make and value and distribute the goods. They must figure out for themselves what justice requires. They must join in the everyday battles through which justice is pursued, which are necessarily fought by particular people in particular times and places. Relief and repair, the primary forms of global justice are never finished. But we can imagine at least a rough agreement on the principles that guide them. And we can imagine a world in which all the existing states are capable of self-help so that mutual aid and reparative justice are only intermittently and occasionally required. I say that the imagining is easy, but obviously we are still very far from that world, very far from the global justice that people need right now. At the same time, men and women who are free from the urgencies of poverty and powerlessness are already engaged in the pursuit of local justice and in the unending, the endless arguments about social goods and values that it requires. One way of expressing the political project that I am advocating in this lecture is to say that everyone should have the justice they need right now so that they are able to pursue the justice that they will never finally have. Thank you. <laughs>